So yesterday, I promoted this concept of adopting a zero trust model. Um, and I wanted to just ask you a rhetorical question. What does that mean to you, right? To me, it means that if I have a device in my hand, I can trust only the things that I'm transmitting from that device, which means I don't trust the network that I'm attached to, even if I'm at work. I don't trust anything that I receive, email or texts. I don't trust anything from my spouse, especially my spouse. <laughs> I don't trust anything from my board of directors or from coworkers. Um, it seems like it's a very difficult position to operate in. Uh, but if you strive for a zero trust model, you will be safer, right? And so what we do at SpyCloud is we focus on interacting with criminals and bringing in data that they're stealing hours after they breach an organization. Um, we take that data and we parse it and make it machine friendly, and then we pass it down to our customers so that if they have a password that's exposed or their employees have a password that's exposed, they can remediate that password, remove it from their rotation, or change the password before a criminal can take action, right? So zero trust to us also means that at work, you don't trust your employees logging in. How do you know when somebody logs in that it's actually your employee? Furthermore, when a customer logs into your website, how do you know it's actually your customer? Right? We've been using multi-factor authentication. We have 90-day password rotation policies in place. We have strong passwords in place. We've had those for years, and we're still having this problem with account takeover. So what do you do? Um, one other thing, too. We have a new feature coming out this week that we're releasing to our, our customers uh, where we can monitor their supply chain. So I'm adding now, how can you trust that a supply chain or a contractor is actually who they say they are when they're logging into your network, right? So it's all, all about account takeover. This is what we focus on. And the reason we focus on account takeover, or ATO, is because it is the number one attack vector. Over malware, over social engineering, it's the number one attack vector. Even nation state, even really sophisticated actors have now adopted this technique to start Whatever they're doing, they start here. You know, when you hear about low-hanging fruit, a, a, a credential that's in the wild is low-hanging fruit to a criminal. And so yesterday, um, I met with a number of you, and I talked about our use cases. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna focus on the products that we sell to enterprises, the three that you see on the left. I'm gonna focus today on how law enforcement is using our data to go after criminals. And the reason I wanna do this is because this is how criminals are coming after us, right? So uh, uh, why is password reuse such a big issue? Uh, first off, it's a big issue because uh, people underestimate the power of this simple technique. Oftentimes you think, okay, I changed my password, I've got this this, this uh, formula that I use for all the different sites, and there's four characters that are same, then I change a date, and I'll use two characters of the form that I'm logging into or whatever, and then I'll add a two, three, or a five, six, and a bang, and that keeps me safe. Um, somebody asked me yesterday, how long should my password be? And I told them 99 characters. <laughs> um, you shouldn't know your passwords. Your password should look like encrypted strings. You should be using a password manager. Ultimately, that's the most ideal approach, is you don't know your passwords. You know one password, and that's to your, to your password manager, and all the passwords that you're using to log into different forums is only really known by the password manager, because they're too complex to even uh, remember. But even if you're using a password manager, that complex password can be uh, harvested from a third-party site, and that complex password can be used against you, right? It doesn't matter if it's 99 characters long. If a criminal has it, they can still log in with that 99 character password. Um, so that, that's a little bit more advanced using a password manager. Most people don't even go there. Most people have five to eight passwords in their rotation. Um, and it's kind of human nature to go through this. We have all done it. Um, I've stopped doing it. 
over the years, but um, the older we get, the more passwords we have in our rotation, which means the younger generations are really in trouble <laughs> because they have fewer passwords to rotate and they're way more active online, right? Does that make sense? Then there's this uh, hidden attack vector. When we talk to enterprises, oftentimes they tell us about all the different things they have in place to protect their employees. And they leave with a, heart, with a, a laptop and it has a firewall on it and IPS technology and you know, EDR and all sorts of stuff on your laptop to make sure the employee's safe. And they go home and they sit in a couch next to their kids who are surfing game sites behind a residential firewall. Their children and their spouses are way more exposed than they are. And if I'm a criminal, I'm going to show you this later, it's easy to find out your personal email address and it's easy to find out who your family members are and go after them instead of your work credential. All right? Okay, so I thought I'd share this story with you. Uh, this actually came from one of our customers. Um, we have a large financial customer that manages 401ks, and every once in a while, they'll get a phone call, and their customer will say, where the hell did my 401k go? It's missing. And so they have to do some research and figure out what happened. And unfortunately, what they're finding is that three months prior to the 401k disappearing, they found that this email address that they're using at the bank was part of a breach. In this case, I'm gonna pick on fantasy football. Let's say you use fantasy football, you logged in, you played last year, you forgot you even had an account and a password out there, and fantasy football gets breached, their credentials are harvested, now they're in the hands of a criminal. Well, in this case, the criminal tried to log in to the bank with that password, and it didn't work because the bank's password requirements were different than fantasy football. It wasn't strong enough. But the criminal was able to log into their Gmail account. Once they logged in their Gmail account, they did a password reset at the bank, and they were able to access the bank. And they're fairly sophisticated, too. They know that if they were to drain the 401k immediately, that would have raised some flag at the bank, and they would have stopped the transaction. So what they did was they changed one thing each day for seven days. Day one, they changed a phone number. Day two, they changed an address. Day, day three, they changed something else. And then seven days later, they drained the funds. True story happens more than you would know. And what I didn't realize at the time when our customer shared this with us, they use our data to go back to the customer to show they weren't culpable, number one, but also to hopefully retain that, that customer uh, when they explain what happened. And I didn't know the 401ks are not insured like checking and savings accounts. So it's mind boggling. So uh, we talked yesterday uh, as well about BEC fraud, business email compromise fraud. This is the number one form of fraud, period. Um, and I mentioned, you may not have heard it because my mic apparently was jacked up, 65% uh, of all fraud being reported to the FBI uh, is BEC fraud. So what is this? This covers CEO fraud, account takeovers where somebody accesses your inbox and they send emails on your behalf, and things like romance schemes, right? Um, and unfortunately, this, is a t this num number came from the FBI two years ago. Um, so it's a bit old now. I'm sure the, numbers, the, the number lost is higher. Uh, but the scary part is the amount of money that has been recovered is only 3%. Tells a, 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 a grim picture of, you know, of the reality that we live in right now. Um, the best way to combat this is to adopt a zero trust model. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about how the criminals operate. Um, I like to use the account takeover timeline to kind of walk through what they do and how they operate and how they're you know, diff different levels of sophistication across the timeline. So day zero, a organization is breached or their credentials are spilled, right? A, uh, a criminal will harvest credentials from a site. 
when they harvest credentials, they're not just taking email addresses and passwords. They're taking everything they can get their hands on. If the forum logged your IP addresses every time you logged in, they're gonna take that. If your forum uh, remembers your old passwords when you change passwords so that you can't use a password twice, they'll get the old passwords as well as the new passwords. So uh, another story real quick, I was presenting it uh, in DC to the federal identity uh, audience and after my presentation, somebody came to me with his phone and he said, hey look, while you're presenting, I got this email and it says that they have all my information and they included a password and they're asking for $1,200 in Bitcoin or they're gonna blackmail me. And I, when I first saw it, I, was, I said, you know, we get those all the time. I mean, there's billions of credentials that are out there. Your, your old passwords are out there. They've been out there for years. So they're just trying to use your old password to scare you out of your money. Well, he said, yeah, but that's my password that I use at Fidelity Bank. <laughs> and I only use it in one place. And so that was kind of a, like a, oh shit moment. <laughs> um, so we took his password, we put it into our system to find out which breaches in the past had that password associated with it. And there were two. And when he looked at the forums, he realized that this password that he uses at Fidelity, first off, Fidelity was not breached. Right? This wasn't a problem with Fidelity. But the password that he used at Fidelity, he uses every once in a while when some system asks you to change your password and you don't want to come up with a new one and try to remember it, so you use the password that you know temporarily, and you go back a couple of days or a week later and you change that password because it's your special password and you don't want it out there. Well, during that short period of time, a forum could be compromised and your special password could be revealed. But what's more, more likely is the forum that you put that password on remembered the old password. And when it was eventually breached, your old password was leaked. And that's what happened in his case. So he realized very quickly that, oh, great, this is, this is a, a bigger problem than I thought. So anyhow, day zero, passwords are, are credentials are spilled. Um, and then they're quickly shared with a small team of individuals that focus on monetizing this information, right? And they do some pretty interesting things along this timeline. So between day zero and day 500, usually a year and a half to two years, they'll do things like they'll fingerprint your organization. They will try to log in with a credential using a botnet. And if you can detect a botnet, they'll try a different technique until, you, until their login goes undetected, right? And then once their login goes undetected, they'll try your password. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. Because they have, there's tools out there like a tool called Purple Spray that will take your password and try thousands of different variations of your password and it will figure out the brute force threshold detection and it will stay under that. And if it has to work for years, it's fine. It's all automated. You don't have to do anything. They just start the job and let it go. Eventually they'll get a password that works, right? This is why even, even if you have four or five characters as part of your rotation and that password leaks, you have to throw away all the passwords that have used those characters in your rotation. So they'll continue to do sophisticated things all along the way, and once they finish monetizing the information, by the way, I should also mention at this point in time, um, if, you, if your company has a 90-day password rotation policy in place, I'm just curious, how many of you are forced to change your password every 90 days? If you'd raise your hands. Okay, go back to your security team and tell them Ted Ross told you to stop doing that. <laughs> um, the reason for that is every time you change a password, if your password hasn't already been exposed, you now give the criminal another chance. You're playing into their hands. You only change your password if it has been exposed. NIST no longer recommends to change a password every 90 days. Large, sophisticated security companies have removed that policy altogether. Okay, so Day 500, they finish monetizing this information. Um, it somehow always ends up leaking to the deep and dark web <laughs> on a forum somewhere. And that term, deep and dark web, is something that we don't like at SpyCloud. It's very misleading. 
Um, but because the industry has adopted it, we'll stick with it in this presentation. Uh, when, it, when the data ends up on a forum somewhere in the deep and dark web, hundreds of criminals will have access to it. Whereas before, it was a small team of sophisticated actors. Now, there's a lot of people, a lot of criminals, fraudsters that have this information. They're not sophisticated, but they're creative, right? It also turns out law enforcement and security companies are all over the deep and dark web. We're scanning it constantly, right? Intel companies looking for your data on the deep and dark web. And then eventually, the data that was leaked on day zero will end up in a combo list. And this is usually when we read about it in the press. Um, somebody will pick it up and realize there's 1.4 billion credentials that are out there. It's one of the largest exposures ever. And all it is is hundreds of prior breaches put together in one database. And now it's being marketed in the underground as a new database. But there are credentials that have been used already. So we like to think of credentials in this space in two different categories. When it gets to the deep and dark web, it's too late. It's too late to remediate. It's already been used by a sophisticated actor most of the time. So credentials before that are very highly valued to criminals. And this is an area that, as an industry, we need to do better at uh, discovering credentials in this, in this part of the timeline so that we can remediate the problem before a criminal can take action. And so this number came from a customer of ours, a large financial institution that focuses on, on uh, cryptocurrency. They uh, have a way of measuring the attacks that come into their, uh, their company. And they have categorized attacks into two different buckets. It's targeted, <clears throat> meaning that somebody has your credential, but they're also trying to get a new token to bypass your multi-factor authentication. And what they found is the targeted attacks are 10% of all the attacks that they, that they receive. And then once the credentials are a commodity, this represents 80% of the attacks that they receive. And as an industry, we have been focused completely on stopping that 80% for the last decade. And so we have tools like Akamai. Akamai does a fantastic job detecting botnets and malicious IP addresses. So if you're using Akamai, or your servers are behind Akamai, they're probably taking care of the 80% for you. Think of it as an account takeover firewall, right? That's what you need to block the 80% in mass scale. Unfortunately, the 10% that come from sophisticated actors causes 80% of the loss for organizations. And that's a space that has, in the past, been fairly underserved. And the only way you really can uh, attack it is to use tradecraft like human intelligence and social engineer the criminals out of the data as early as possible in that timeline so that you can basically beat the criminal to the password. Change the password before a criminal can take advantage of it. So I thought I would share this with you. Um, my heritage, my fitness pal, the Under Armour breach, these are fairly recent breaches. Uh, they were in the press. Um, I think most people have read about these, and probably a lot of people in this room were part of those breaches. Um, so I highlighted them in yellow. But there's a lot of other breaches on this slide. We've been measuring uh, when the breach actually occurred and when it leaked to the deep and dark web, and everybody was able to gain access to it. All the security companies should have access to it at that point, when it became a commodity. And as you'll see, criminals have a long time with these credentials to do sophisticated, nefarious things with them before it becomes a commodity. The last column is what I'm pointing out here. All right, so now that uh, I've kind of set the stage for you know, what criminals are doing, how they're using it, I'm gonna walk to the back of the room so that your attention is not on me. It's on the screen, and I'm gonna show you our investigation tool. 
So we have law enforcement using our data to go after criminals. We also have large enterprises that have sophisticated uh, investigator teams going after criminals. And I'm going to flip to a tool called Maltigo. So let me run you through an example of an investigation. For those of you that are recording this, please do not record the screen right now. I'm going to show you things that we do not want in the public's eye. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, this is an email that came in soon after we came out of stealth mode. Uh, went to our, the guy who runs sales, and it came from me apparently. And he asked, you know, the whole, you know, can I do a wire, can, can, can you send me some money, right? Wasn't a very good attempt either. So we sent it over to our CTO who loves, uh, you know, playing around with these criminals. And he set up a whole storyline and convinced the, uh, the criminal that we were lovers and that we wanted to run away and embezzle money. And we needed accounts to put the money in. He was gonna help us out, so he gave us a whole bunch of accounts. And every time you give us an account, we call the bank and we have it shut down. <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun. The way we found this, the way we could verify it, and this is something you could do very easily, when you have an email that comes in your inbox, go to the raw data. I'm showing you a screenshot of an Apple mail uh, a raw data check. And somewhere in the raw data, you're gonna see the reply to email address. Now. I use a different email for this, and I see Vic over there laughing, because this is Jennifer, our CFO, uh, who got the same, uh, a similar email later on. And when we looked at the raw data, it came from this other email address. So now we have a way of looking at who this person is, finding out a little bit more about them, right? Uh, I highly recommend you adopting this technique when you get an email that you think is strange, look at the raw data, see the reply to, you know, see if it actually matches the display email address. If it doesn't, you know it's fraudulent. But even if it does map to the email address, you have to be careful of one thing. Another story, a title company. True story. Title company was breached. The criminal was watching somebody's email. They knew the day that somebody was supposed to put a down payment on a house with their life savings. And so they sent an email to that person from the title company's inbox with the title company letterhead, all formatted from prior emails the title company has sent, so it looks completely legit. And they got it on the day they're expecting it. And they asked them to wire transfer the money. They gave them the account number, and they did. Hours later, or day, a day later, they get an email from the title company asking them to wire transfer the money. <laughs> this time it actually came from the title company. And so if you look at those emails, the reply to is actually the title company because they were compromised and the criminal is sending email from their company. So you still can't trust it even if it comes from the company. And so I typically like to leave with recommendations. Uh, we've already talked about this enough. I'm not gonna pound it into you. Uh, I have a whole other list of recommendations that I, I like to leave behind. Use password managers. We know that password managers don't scale to you know, tens of thousands of employees, but as an individual, you should be using a password manager everywhere you go. Use a VPN. Don't trust this network that you're on right now. Um, don't trust coffee shops. Don't trust your work network. Um, and with that, thank you very much.